What does it look like to design for the common good? What were the flaws in the ways that we've designed in the past? These are some of the largest questions facing us today. And today, we get to dive into these questions with Akasha Lawrence Spence. Akasha is an architect, developer, was a state representative, and was one of our first guests at Design Vancouver. Today is a special episode where we catch up with Akasha in her district in Portland on, yes, another glorious sunny day. Could you believe it? The conversation is wide ranging, but really zeroes in on what does it look like to begin to design for the common good, especially as we take a look backwards at the injustices that have been historically present through our nation. This will be part of an ongoing series where we'll catch up with some of our presenters from the past. So we hope that you enjoy this next iteration of the Roadcast, and we'll look forward to seeing you down the road. Episode three of the Roadcast. Excited. We are catching up today with Akasha Lawrence Spence. She was one of, she was the inaugural class of presenters at Design Vancouver. And so uh, we were just saying that it feels like it's been forever since 2019, but thanks for sitting down and taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for coming and, and being in uh, lovely Portland. Yeah, where are we? Where are we right now? <laughs> we're on the por park block. Um, really close to PSU, like we can see the art museum, the Portland Art Museum from right here, from yeah. where I'm sitting. Um, and I love coming up here. It's just like a serene place. And on the weekends, you'll have the Saturday market a little further up. And so it's just, it's just chill. It's perfect. Serene. It's and got a great vibe today. Canopy, so I love it. And we caught sunshine in April. We're three yeah. for three on our episodes. <laughs> always, Knock always on. sunny. Knock on wood. Knock on wood. Never <laughs> rains in Portland. Isn't that the Timbers thing? It never rains. Never rains in the Rose City. No pity in the Rose City. I, I don't, don't think that would be accurate at all. <laughs> I think that would be. I don't know. It's I didn't not say accurate. That. Not at all. Um, there's so much to catch up on. Yeah. I think a good place to start um, would be your journeys. Like since 2019. Yeah. Um, and for folks that maybe don't know you, architect, architect, developer, and then now state representative, added to the the growing repertoire yeah. of things. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking maybe a good place to start is, so you have this like, you have these three, and in your mind, maybe it makes perfect sense how they've just all rolled into the next. Yeah. But curious, just take us kind of on that journey of how they have progressed and how maybe each of those things have informed each other in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I always say that I do the same work, but it manifests in different ways, right? Um, the purpose and the intention behind everything I do is the same. It's about the equitable distribution of resources. Mm. It's about decision-making power. It's about my fundamental question of who gets to decide, mm. right? And so as somebody who practiced design and architecture, you know, it was always about trying to bring the community into what we're building, mm -hmm. right? What is being done in your name? Um, how is this breaking ground going to better the circumstances in your community? How is it going to reflect your needs? How is it going to um, help you get where you want to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, we all have a vision of our future and how is that going to help it manifest? Um, and then becoming a developer, it was really about having community-led community development. Right? It was sure. about the fact that too often, especially in a city like Portland, we saw people coming in from the outside um, and saying that we need more hotels. Well, that seems like the antithesis to what we need given our housing crisis and mm. given our homelessness crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, how do we get development that reflects the needs of the people on the ground? Mm. How do we get development that does not displace people but helps to root them where they already are. Yeah. How do we have development that um, really empowers people, right? Yeah. Because that's what decision-making power does. It empowers you to say that you, have, you can get to decide what the landscape of your life looks like, right? The built environment is a reflection of our values. Mm -hmm. And if it's just a very select few people um, making those decisions, then that's as a value signal as well because we're saying that we don't value collectivism we mm. value um you know 
sort of um, extraction or, or uh, allowing just a small segment of the population to make decisions for everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't think that that's the future that any of us want. Um, and so going into uh, the House seat, it's funny when we talk about a select few people being able to choose, <laughs> because that's exactly what happened, yeah. right? Um, what was ha happening before that, so just to give you a little bit more context, yeah. Um, my first degrees were in political science and anthropology. Um, I worked for Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. I worked on campaigns in New York City. Um, and I left that work um, and went into design. Mm. I moved to Oregon to tr change my career. I chose Oregon to change my career, to change my life. And um, getting here, I was at architectural firms and seeing the ways in which we had to depend on ballot measures to build something new, right? So mm -hmm. there was a huge ballot measure that was going on that said that we needed to seismically upgrade our, our public schools and to get the lead out of the pipes and to really modernize um, public schools. And if that ballot measure didn't pass, the firm wouldn't have gotten the contract to build a new Lincoln High School, which mm. is currently being built right now a couple blocks from here. Mm. Um, and so everything kept coming full circle, right? You had to have the collective vote to modernize these schools so that the architectural firm could break ground, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. At the same time, you know, in that space where I was creating um, a separate business, <laughs> I had a different business while I was working at that architectural firm um, called Him Space, in which I was creating space for people to, designers like us, to come together um, and have a place where you could do the things that you want to do when you're thinking that you're thinking about while you're at work working on some other design yeah, yeah, right yeah. so we all are thinking okay i'm working on this project oh i have this idea for this thing and i want to do this and i want to execute on it. this and i want to do this but what happens in that liminal space between mm. leaving work and going home yeah you're excited about it and then you get home and things change you have to make dinner yeah you end up eating Ooh, dinner that. you end up on the couch and then it's the next morning, and you you haven't done anything to meet that goal. What was the name of the endeavor? Oh, Him Space. H Y M N Space. Oh, okay. Um, I looked at infrastructure that was already existing, mm -hmm. so coffee shops in particular. Okay. And Portland has the, the most coffee shops per capita than even Seattle, mm -hmm. like for a Yo, city, yeah. right? We yeah, have yeah. so many Tons coffee, coffee shops. And so I was looking at the fact that. In the evenings, a lot of these coffee shops close at like 3 p.m. or 5 yeah. p.m., right? And so in the evening, especially in those winter months, these spaces are shut down and mm -hmm. they're not activated. And so it becomes like a lull in, yeah, yeah. you know, your community where it's just like close, mm -hmm. you know? And so I was like, well, how could we activate these spaces for a reason, for a specific gotcha, purpose, gotcha. right? And it was really for designers and creatives who need that something in that that exists in that liminal space to get gotcha, you gotcha. to do those projects that yeah. are your passion projects. So before you hit before you get to the house, it almost acts as that liminal space, an extension yeah. of that liminal space. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and the uh, free thinking luxury yeah. of time there to yeah. work on things that you're passionate about. Right. So exactly. why him? What what's the oh, yeah, story good, behind him? Good good question. So um, I grew up in the church <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that always struck me about, you know, going to fellowship, like going somewhere physically to fellowship was the scripture that says where two or three are gathered, mm. you know, there the Lord is present. You know, there's yeah. something that happens when you have two or three gathered together. And I just kept thinking about when you're in church and you're everybody's there and you, you stand up and you have your, your hymn, hymnal out and yeah. you're singing, everybody's like looking in the same direction, mm -hmm. singing from the same hymn. You're either reading it to sing it or somebody's playing the organ or the, the piano or, or, or the whatever, whatever instrument, the harp, what yeah. have you. And people are singing it and we're all doing this in unison, right? Because we're striving to get somewhere better than where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that is what we as designers are always trying to do. We're striving to get mm. somewhere better than where we are now through our craft, through mm -hmm. our design, whether it's architecture or graphic design or whatever. And so for me, it was like, well, how do we gather together again, right? Because I can rent an office space, and mm -hmm. I did before I, I created Him Space. Yeah. 
to try to sit there and go through that process on my own. But there's nothing like knowing somebody else next to you yeah, I love it. is also working towards something. And it's nothing like knowing that, oh, I might not have this skill set. I, I'm learning something new, but this designer also has that. He yeah. is very versed in it. How can I be with these other people? And because we're together, because we're all striving for something, the energy changes. And I'm able to resource, you know, yeah, between us and do so something. Good. Like, do something, you know? Yeah. And so... In that time, I started to ha host um, informational meetings mm. about what was going on on our ballots and things like that. And having other organizations come in and share with people how to fill out your ballots as they come in. Because we're very lucky in the state of Oregon that we have our mail-in ballots and you get this pamphlet of mm -hmm. like this is the ballot measure these are the people on the uh, on the ballot this is you know but it's still not enough information mm -hmm. and t trying to decode hmm. what it means yeah. when you see television ads saying that y vote yes or vote no and, and both seem very compelling mm -hmm. which way do you go yeah and so having a forum where people could ask questions yeah. and, and get to understand and get to the meat of the issue was really important for me and somebody came and said, oh, you're so great at this. Why do you do this? And I said, because people should be involved. And they asked me to run and join this program called Emerge, okay. which um, helps women run for office. Mm. And I just did it because why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Why you not? Know, why not? And um, what was going on was another woman decided that she was going to step down from the seat mm -hmm. to run for a different position. And so people were already campaigning and going out and knocking on doors. This is pre-COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so knocking on, <laughs> knocking on doors and meeting, um, you know, the voters face to face and yeah. understanding, like, what are the issues that you care about? What are the things that you want somebody who represents you in the long term mm -hmm. to be fighting for? Right. Um, what are the decisions that you want made in yeah. your name? And... Then she stepped down before the short session, which was what was hap going to happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. And so that you can't have a seat vacant. You have to always fill it. Mm -hmm. And so the appointment process was triggered. And again, there were these four people already vying for the seat, meeting people on their doorsteps. And so I said really early on, I was like, OK, somebody needs to go in as an interim candidate. And then my phone started ringing off the hook <laughs> because I had this concept. Yeah. And I had already taken a merge. And so I, and you know, I had that background. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'm tapped in. I can do it. I'll just do it for the year and it'll be a short session. I'll get to, you know, <laughs> I'll get to this do This is what, what date is this? I want to know. It's this like. Is in, this, this is like uh, November, December oh. of 2019. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah, of 2019. And we did design the Vancouver in October. <laughs> yeah, I was like, just a short little time. It's not a big deal. I'll just do it. Easy just, year. We'll easy, just cruise easy, through short this session, thing. Eight weeks. You know, you're going to just do it and it'll be boom, boom, boom. Oof. Super easy. And um, I'll get to do like a big civic engagement like yeah. platform and I'll just like bring people in and I'll do anything that I want to do and it'll just be really great. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know what happened, bum, bum, right? Bum. Bum, bum, bum. We all know what happened. Yeah. Um, we did have that short. Amazing. I was appointed. Mm -hmm. um, we did have that short session. Um, we had a huge Republican walkout, so we only got two bills passed. Mm. Um, and then COVID. <laughs> then COVID. And our whole world changed yeah. really rapidly and, and overnight. I keep going back. I remember in your at the end of your talk in 2019, you kind of hit on this. It just is bringing to bringing it to me right now. This luxury of time, mm, yeah. That creation of wealth for the luxury of time to think about more solutions or whatever's rumbling in your stomach, yeah. For the common good, yeah. And just I love how you're always. It feels like you're always trying to create that space. Like yeah. early on, I'm going like, what does this space look like here? Yeah. Um, so. It's something I love. Uh, the other thing that popped into my head was from the outside watching your campaign. I live in Washington. It was connected to newsletters. Yeah. You know, it was kind of one of my first times just, you know, watching someone lead through it like this. Yeah. And 
your communication was uncanny. Like your newsletters were like novels where it was like, I mean, is this how it always goes with leaders? And I was like, this can't be how it goes. And so I'd love to unpack when you were thinking about how you were wanted to design the way you were going to serve, you know, what were some of those things that you knew, like those bedrock values? Because listening to your early stories of like helping people understand what was going on, yeah. um, you definitely made that happen in the digital space. Yeah where you, I was like, I'm as informed as I've ever been. I don't even live in this district, but I know what's going on. Yeah. So it was cool to see. I wanted to just maybe unpack some of those things that you were hoping for and yeah. what you did, how you designed to like pull those things off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really great question. And I, I will say that um, I've had, through those newsletters and the way that I communicated, I had a record number of town halls and informational mm. sessions and things like that, like get to know, get to understand this process kind of thing. And I ha heard from my constituents that they were like, in the, like people, m most of the people who interact with government tend to be older people. Okay. Are people who are yeah. retired and have time <laughs> to get involved, right? And so they were like, I am, 67 years old and I've been involved in politics my whole life or I've gotten involved in the last 30 years and I've never had this level of communication mm. from anybody ever. Yeah. Thank you. You know, and so for me, again, I think transparency and accountability and um, collective knowledge is how we move things forward. Mm -hmm. If we keep things um, buried, if people don't understand the context or the history or what's happening, then they can't get involved, right? They, yeah. can't, they can't rally for what is good in their community. They can't mm -hmm. be at the decision-making table, right? For me, it's always about how do I get more people at the decision-making table? How do I get them informed at the decision-making table? Mm -hmm. And so when I designed the, my, um, my service, I, even in my office, I told my staff that we were going to do this in an egalitarian manner, right? Like usually there's, a, there's a, the representative or the, the elected mm -hmm. and their chief of staff and then the, the rest of their staff um, and there's a defined hierarchy. Mm. And I was like, no, we're all going to know, the left hand is going to know what the right hand is doing. We're mm. all going to share everything. Everybody has a voice and an idea and a perspective that is unique to them mm -hmm. and will help us do this work better, mm -hmm. right? And so it was a little challenging for my, my chief of staff because they had worked in the legislature before mm. and were like, they were like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> this is just, yeah. they didn't tell me that in, in yeah, hindsight yeah, 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 when yeah. they were like so grateful for how well it worked. They were like, I was so hesitant and I yeah. was like, this is not going to work. And after pushing through it, they realized it was the best work environment that they mm. had in the legislature. And they're now doing their new office in the same manner. They've designed their, their new mm -hmm. office in the same manner. And so again, I think it's that same level of bringing people to the same, mm -hmm. um, on the same playing field, right? Informing people so they can make decisions. Mm -hmm. Informing people so that everything remains transparent. Connecting it back to the project that you're currently working on. Yeah. Um, would love to hear more about that. We want to create an international black arts festival here next year, 2022. And the impetus is to really celebrate the um, protest art, the best of the protest art that happened around the world. So we're doing that in 2022. So if anybody's interested, <laughs> contact me. We, are, yes. we need a lot of help. And so and this a is a gather, but your, the call for art is global. Yeah, it's global. So what you saw on my Instagram though, is that we didn't want to have this year pass where we did nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So we're pushing towards that larger festival, but we didn't want to have this year mm -hmm. pass and we didn't do anything. So we decided to have, um, so the, the collective is now called a Movement for Black Art. Mm -hmm. And we decided to have a gathering in diasporic repast. So a repast is what happens when um, somebody, a friend or family member, a loved one dies, mm. and you go over to their home. And it's, there's a lot of food. Everybody's just bringing food, right? And 
you talk about your pain points and how sad it is, but you also talk about your, your glory points. You laugh at like, oh, remember that time we got there and we got, oh my God, you know, and you mm -hmm. do that thing. Like you're having that like gotcha. recollection, right? And so this um, thing that's happening on this gathering that's happening on May 30th um, in Peninsula Park is really about this intimate space. Like if we're at a friend's home, you know, if you're at your family's home and there's going to be food there and it's just going to be just sweet, like it's supposed to be sweet. And you're, you're going to have people's families there that are going to talk about what happened to that person at the time that they died, either from police brutality or COVID-19. Mm. So all of that is like, how do we memorial, memorialize the lives lost, but also celebrate what it means to have had them here with us at some point, right? And to tell those anecdotes of what it me might mean, especially for those who have died right here in Portland, um, to us, to that family member. We might not have known them, but they can talk about them and share those things mm. with us. And then we're gonna have artists come and sing and dance and perform and do the things and we're going to have little breakout things where you have tents and so then um, it might be just four of us and somebody's reciting a poem and only the four of us can hear it mm. and then there's another person who's dancing or doing something and only the six of us around can see it you know so you're having these this bigger moments yeah. of like you know coming together and, and holding each other and then you're having these smaller intimate spaces where that you're really connecting with the art and the artist and just feeling that and holding space. Hmm. So that's what's happening on May 30th. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Peninsula Park. Peninsula Park. So, uh, and the name of it again is? So the, the name of the, the group is the Movement for Black Art and this event is called Gathering and Diasporic Repast. <laughs> And that does make me think of that initial, like, working for Schumer's office and then making this decision to move to Oregon. Um, and then, not to say things ever, ever left you, but there's a, a little bit of a full circle moment of stepping back oh, into yeah. this. And oh, just God. the... Yeah. Here's no, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that because I, it's something that I grappled with, it, you know, the things that I do in government or in the political space were things that I just, I thought I would never do again. I thought I would never be there, you mm -hmm. know? And it's kind of what Sandra was talking about. So nobody knows who Sandra is, <laughs> but Sandra, <laughs> Sandra. She you, should have been our guest. We, we need a chair for Sandra. <laughs> um, Sandra is a passersby who, you know, we were talking to. And, thought we were just chit-chatting. Thought we were just like standing up, hanging out today, which we are. <laughs> That's we are. exactly right. Um, but, um, you know, she talked about the ways in which, you know, you let the, you dream big, right? You have mm -hmm. dreams, you have goals, you have things you want to do. But then there is this calling. There is something that is inside of you that sometimes you fight. If you listen, you might fight it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I was called to do. Mm -hmm. It's part of my purpose. It's not something that I would choose for myself. Yeah. Um, but I can't ignore the call. So it's a responsibility and yeah. service, you know? And it's, an, it's fundamental to all the things that I do. And it's just going to help me to do the things that I do in a different way, yeah. you know? It's the same mission, same values but expressed in a different way. Yeah, it's an interesting, I was thinking, makes me think about the, in your talk from 2019, talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. and even for a small business that you need, you need safety, you need security. And until that happens, you can't experience belonging. And then yeah. once, you, once you experience belonging, then you can move to this self-actualization. Yeah. And then you have this moment of, the luxury of time yeah. or however you want to call it yeah. where hey I get to imagine and self-actualize a little yeah. bit here and that when you reach that point that for you it feels like there is this right then there is this call there's something else that you've tuned into mm -hmm. you know um, and that you're longing for for other people yeah. to get to that space yeah. to then recast the future in a more equitable community-minded loving world hopefully yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, again with Sandra. <laughs> Sandra? I, she, you know, she, she referenced this Oprah quote, quote that says that if we all did what we were called to do, I think we all have callings. You know, you mm. know how many accountants really want to be writers? Mm. And yeah. how many, how many stockbrokers really want to be painters? And it's like, well, what if you just didn't do that? And you actually did the thing that your spirit has been calling you to do? How much better would our world be, you know, if we weren't you know, trapped in this survival mode, because that's what it is, right? Yeah. Where, when we are constantly in a, in a space where we think, oh, I have to do this so I can eat, so I can pay my mortgage or my rent, so I can, mm -hmm. you know, pr make sure my family has health insurance and all of the things that we have to think about because we don't have that safety net for people. Mm -hmm. We don't take care of basic rights and basic needs. Um, that we are all not self-actualizing and like what's the point of being a human if we can't do all the things that we were put here to mm -hmm. do or meant to do or in our spirit to do. Yeah. So you, I just want people to have the space to, to, to follow those dreams and not have the fear of not being, not being able to survive, not being able to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want anybody to be a starving artist. I don't romanticize that at all. Mm -hmm. Eat. <laughs> Live Who are full artists. You know, be a full art. Could you imagine what you would create on a full stomach? You know, I mean, and some, yeah, I could keep going with no, that. No, but I think but. it's good. I mean, it connects back to the, the hymn space mm -hmm. and the liminal space. Yeah. And, um, and it is, there's tensions. We're not going to, there isn't a silver bullet for it. I do think like speaking to people, you know, I don't know. I think it's encouraging, you know, for someone that's done it and that that small nudge to be like listen to that voice and yeah. do what's do what's calling you and take the leap yeah. um, but then also you the hard work of trying to rebuild and build systems that support that for everybody yep yep um, yeah it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a luxury time shouldn't be a luxury it should be a given mm -hmm. like i would love to see more people i mean that that was the beauty of covid kind of right mm. is that for some of us the lucky ones of us who were able to stay home if home was a pleasant environment. So there's so many caveats, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to take meetings under the tr under a tree. I mean, I wish we didn't have the meeting at all, but <laughs> <laughs> we were able at least yeah. to take meetings under a tree. I see people bike on the on the bikes, um, the e-bikes, the city bikes, the yeah, Nike yeah, yeah. bike town bikes. <laughs> So many words. Nike bikes, city bikes, <laughs> New York city bikes, you know. Anyway, um, just having meetings or just, you know, doing things with their kids a little bit more. Yeah. You know, you spend so much more time with the people you work with than the people that are in your home. That like It feels like a good it feels like that moment we're right there, like it could pass of like reimagining this hybrid work. I know, we need to. You know, and it's like we're right here because you can feel it coming, like things were thawing out. Yep. But I do think that there were some for those that were lucky enough or fortunate enough, like, but hopefully it does reimagine how we so. how we think about the way we work. And then we can so, use all this empty office space for housing. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> um, this being a road trip of sorts. Yeah. Is there a road trip that you've taken that stands out in your mind that's like your favorite? Mm, that is a good question. You know, it's funny, I'm going to cast this in a, in a future one because I really had a concept to drive across the country this summer. I wanted to do that. I mean, we've got I this. know. I might have to borrow it. Do it. Um, sure. But I really want to drive across the country because for most of my childhood, when I traveled, I traveled outside of America. Okay. And I just, moving to Oregon and just being in the majesty and the beauty of this country, yeah. it's just so beautiful. It's it's, it's so amazing. So it's so amazing. diverse. It's, it's so gorgeous. And then I went to Montana for my 30th, and um, we were in the Grand Tetons, and we, we did a little bit of Jackson Hole, and oh my, we were in Jackson. It was just, gore. it was just, oh my God. It was just, you just, the, the majesty of it. it yeah. just, you're just breathless and speechless. And so I was like, okay, I want to just see all of it. <laughs> I want to go I see all it. of it. Yeah. So I'm excited about, do, it might not happen this summer because of my announcement. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it at some to. point. Absolutely. I'm going to do it. I have to do it. 
sooner rather than later. Yeah, I'm hoping we're gonna take this on the road. We're gonna go down San Francisco, LA, San Diego, and back this summer, so. Send postcards. Oh, we will send postcards. <laughs> I wanna know who we should go visit. Who do you, oh. like a designer, a cre creator, a thinker. Oh my gosh. That like you have got to stop and chat with them. Artists. Artists. And designers here in town. Yeah. I think for sure you should talk to um, the people who are running the Nat Turner Project. Nat Turner Project, okay. Um, you should definitely talk to Intasar Abiyoto. She is doing, she's a photographer, dancer, visual artist. She does some amazing, amazing work um, around, well, I'll let her tell you. Okay. And um, I think also Christine Miller, Sharita Town, Rob Lewis, Donovan um, Smith. Stacey Valkyrie, Tristan Irving. I mean, there's so many, there's so many amazing creatives right here that I think Love it. if you're doing a artist Series, thing, like yeah. an artist, a 15 minutes with this artist, yeah. um, I would call all of those people. Okay. What are you hopeful for, for Portland in the next couple of years? I'm hopeful that um, we're gonna utilize this moment, this this awakening to actualize the future that we all want to see, one that is um, inclusive of everyone. Um, yeah, one that means that everybody in Portland is living their best life, you know? One that is truly free and liberated. And I had that hope for all of America and all of, all of humanity, really, to, mm. to live a truly liberated life and, in, and have us as a community decide what that means and what that looks like. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking. Thanks for inviting me. It was so good to reconnect. Yeah, thanks I can't for wait coming to, to I can't hood. wait to come to D.C., you know, and <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're not the only one. Everybody's trying to catch you off guard with stuff like that. They're yeah. trying to sneak attack. Trying to sneak attack. <laughs> so when you are a, uh, it goes from congresswoman to state senator to president, the president, all kinds of things. <laughs> so go. It's all right. Make your announcement. It's, she's running for president. Everyone, you heard it here first on the Design Vancouver podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>